Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. We all know theory and practice. Theory and what? Theory and practice. Theory and what? Practice. With a question mark, because what Peter and I have already shown you is that this is taken for granted term and all of the behaviors related to it somewhat unknown or at least not well understood. In this conversation, we talk about the myths and untested assumptions that we've thought of so far about the nature of practice. So we continue. Well, it's good to continue our conversation and look into another set of our conjectures about the nature of practice. But before we do, Peter, why don't I once again remind people of the departure point from which we have done a lot of this thinking over the last yeah, months. I, I like to call it our way of thinking about practice. Practice is the conscious ability fairly consistently to produce intended results and to do so across a range of circumstances and to do so while growing and changing oneself to meet the changing circumstances in which one's practice exists. There it is. And that has proved to be a pretty useful um, way of thinking for us. It has, it has generated all these conjectures that we're talking about in these podcasts. And uh, so uh, we would invite uh, listeners to reflect on that way of thinking, use it to tweak it and, and uh, refine it to make it useful for themselves. Um, and go from there. I've, uh, when I was reading it, I was uh, one, just marveling at the wonderful aspect called while growing and changing oneself to meet the changing circumstances yeah. into which one's practice exists. And I think today we talk about some of the dynamics of, of practice. Uh, the payoff for the listener to think deeply about practices, yeah. whether you know it or not, circumstances are making you in a putting you in a position where you can grow or you can ignore but growth is better so what what would you like to talk about in this regard peter well <clears throat> we have a few conjectures here that we've been calling curiosities because i guess i would say they excite our curiosity <laughs> and um, we have another category of conjectures which we'll be talking about in a future podcast called myth, Myths and Beliefs of, um, of Practice. Um, so we're going to try to cover the way the world looks at practice, uh, or I won't say cover it, but open up the way the world looks at practice and thinks of practice. So that's what these conjectures are intended to stimulate. Uh, the first one, t to me, is, is, uh, is kind of fun. And I, I phrase it to myself as practice is both a noun and a verb. And what I mean by that is, uh, of course, in this noun sense, practice, a, a lawyer could speak of my practice, and he'd be using the word practice as a noun. But if he said I was practicing law, he would not be using it as a noun, he'd be using it it's what they call a gerund. And a gerund is simply a verb to practice that um, you turn around and put ing on it and it becomes a noun. So practice and practicing can be kind of slippery in, in terms of their use and meaning. For instance, I like to say theorize. The theory is not practice. But theorizing is practice, mm -hmm. or at least can be if a person is careful about it. Uh, and uh, it's a, that's a nice example of, of how the, the two words fit together. And there are plenty of uh, fields where the practitioner uses both, both practice and practicing. Um, a concert pianist, for instance, does a lot of practicing 
but he or she most definitely has a practice and that practice of, of course is called performing the the piano art but uh practice and practicing keep coming up in my experience but then there's some there are some verbs like uh golfing and to and to golf or to play golf i guess you could say the, the expression to play golf uses golf as a noun there but um a predicate noun but golfing is a gerund and uh i like sail and sailing i i don't know what noun use we have for sail for the word sail but sailing is is the active practice of the noun nursing is another one where there probably no very common use of the noun nurse nurse you don't have nursemanship or you have nursing and that expresses both the noun form in the form of that gerund as well as the verb form of of to nurse to nurse a patient uh so i don't know i i, I just am kind of uh walking around the subject here because i'm trying to intrigue listeners in the um subtlety with which the two words or the two forms actually three forms if you count verbs gerunds and nouns the word practice can appear but uh as i'm listening to this and letting the noun and the gerund roll around the noun says the what it, it is it, it it but it's that it's static it's frozen in that sentence whereas the growth the challenging the thinking the learning is all in the doing. So, well, one takes that piano word and then puts it into practicing piano, and then, you know, it's just, it's just to me is when we get to the action is where the payoff resides. Uh, so it's not just moving those terms around. It get that okay, why, why do I care? Well, if you're not inging, doing ing, <laughs> you're probably not moving <laughs> forward in time. <laughs> Um, another uh, conjecture that I think is kind of interesting is the idea that uh, practice is eliminative. And by that I mean the practitioner, the skilled practitioner, knows what not to pay attention to in, in, in a given moment of practice, as well as what the key, the two or three or four variables to pay attention to in, the, in one's practice. And um, there are lots of times I know with doctors, in my experience with the, in the medical world, where I don't I don't understand what they're doing with my symptoms. Uh, they're paying attention to some of them that I uh, am concerned about, but then they're uh, I bring other symptoms into the clinic. And they don't seem to. It doesn't seem to impress anybody with that, with any uh, with any significance. So the skilled practitioner knows what not to pay attention to, as well as what to pay attention to. Has that occurred to you too? Oh yes, definitely. And and as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking the quality movement, the Pareto effect, looking for the few that creates the most impact. Uh, on results, there's a whole lot of interest going forward in the value of time now. So the more proficient you become in a particular practice uh, so that you can rule out the things that you don't need to immediately address, you have a much better impact on the, the point, whatever the point may be. And that's with the speed of light that business and other enterprises going these days, uh, the last thing you want to do is be wandering all over, like I am learning how to run a podcast. Uh, but eventually, you get better at it, and you you reduce the the uh, the noise, <laughs> and you get right to 
the clarity that uh, is the payoff, I think, for what you just shared with us. And that that is the learning process, or the as we have said in earlier podcasts, the continual learning process that the practitioner is undergoing to um, learning what not to pay attention to, what can be eliminated from the immediate concern, and what are and what are the key variables to pay attention to. I'd like to throw in now a conjecture that to me is one of the more important ones in in um, all of all of professional education. Now, um, there's a joke that about a professor, a definition of a professor. Uh, you probably heard this. I don't know. Uh, as someone who thinks the human race would be better off if it just knew more about his subject. Oh yeah, well that's me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you and I are are professors of of a subject you might call human behavior in organizations, which is a, a very large umbrella. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have spent a lot of time focusing on, on leadership and on the impact of technology uh, on organizations. I don't know what particular um, areas of the organizational behavior field you are especially interested in, but in any event, the professor, but um, we were talking about that. So, the field of human behavior in organizations is is a very large umbrella, but in a way, I don't think it's too much of a distortion, or it uh, to to insist that in a way, all pro- education for all professional practice involves talking about organizations and talking about human relationships as uh, as key key factors and yet and yet my perception is that no one is teaching about human behavior in organizations directly except a rather small number of faculty members on in each school who are presumably professors of the stuff uh-huh. but it's it tends to get sequestered off in a corner where the students regard it as an easy A and don't take it t- too seriously, at least while they're students. I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of times alumni have come back to to visit me and they and they say, I wish I had taken more human behavior courses when I was in when I was in school. I because it has, it has proved to be so important. So an additional dimension of all of this is leadership. The practitioner is, practitioner is frequently in a position of leadership where he or she is trying to get some others, clients or the organization they're a member of or whoever, to uh, do something different. Leadership is concerned with change, and practitioners are introducing change into systems all the time. and so do practitioners need to know something about leadership? You're darn right. Do they hear very much about themselves as leaders? No, they don't. Uh, and that to me is a, is a tragedy. I had an amusing experience of that phenomenon when I discovered that nothing about leadership is taught in any of the 11 seminaries in the Washington DC area where I was, where I was for so many years, I happened to know the executive director of the consortium of member schools. And I said, you know, I've heard that one school in particular, it happened to be, I think it was a Methodist school, didn't have any leadership in its curriculum for training some students in, uh, for the ministry. And he said, "Oh yeah, they, they all have that problem. They, they most of them are not, not not even sensitive to the to the need for." I had another experience where I sent a young man uh, for Christmas. I sent him, who was in a seminary getting ready to graduate. I sent him a Christmas present of uh, a book called Leadership as an Art. And uh, when we talked to him on the phone, he said, you know, this is a very interesting book, but why did you give it to me? And, and I said, 
Well, you know, you're 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 trained to be a, a a minister to have a congregation, and you're going to be a leader of the congregation. And this is a really interesting discussion of leadership. And he said, "Gosh, you know, we don't hear anything about that in in." Uh, we learn how to translate Aramaic into Greek, but uh, we don't know learn anything about leadership. That's, um, a, that's a stunning realization, and I'm thinking of it just to insert a bit here, that in order to accomplish one's practice, you are sometimes making a leadership effort because that's the only way you can move through the through this circumstances that are presented. You know, you've got to ask someone to step aside or you ask someone to get to release a resource. And it's not just to be a leader per se, it's to get further ahead in your practice. <laughs> so there's a very self-important motive for knowing leadership, whether it's for uh, when you're golfing or when you're preaching. But it's certainly, when my thought is, when you're preaching, when you're leading a conversation, con uh, you're leading <laughs> a congregation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's why you go to church to be led, to, uh -huh. so you can follow the the line of thought. But it is a, it is a key point that as we are having this conversation about the importance of practice, practice, several other lines of research and disciplines keep coming back in and presenting themselves. Last week we talked about the last time we talked about learning. Now we're talking about leading. And that's what happens when you start peeking into the hood of these conjectures. That's exactly right. The practitioner, uh, the the practice of practice is uh, of a practice is so multidimensional, so and so rich in in its many different facets. And some practice some practices you can understand why they take a long time to learn. Others may be picked up more quickly. But, you know, practitioners have an additional problem in the world of communication, an additional problem that to me is quite striking. Have you ever had your doctor talk to you using technical language where you had no idea what he was saying? Yeah, it's getting uh, the heck out of me. <laughs> uh, or uh, your, your auto mechanic who comes out in his greasy overalls and tells you, you're going to need a new what you might call it because your this or of that is is blown and you don't know exactly what any of that uh, means. Now, the, particularly with all the computer controls in cars, it's especially opaque as to what these folks are saying. And I have run into this phenomenon so often where a specialist practitioner speaks in a way that a layperson can't understand it. I originally, I'd like to read you a poem that I wrote to capture this phenomenon. I originally called it the layman's lament, but I have since given it another title, which I'll share with you after I've read you this poem, just half a page. And it goes like this. You understand something and I don't. You understand that I don't understand but you don't understand what it is I don't understand. I understand that I don't understand, but I don't understand what it is that I don't understand. Not only do you not understand what it is I don't understand, you don't understand how you came to understand what it is that you understand. You understand that your understanding is more advanced than mine, but you don't understand exactly how it is more advanced nor do you understand how to make yourself simple again like me. I understand that your understanding is more advanced than mine, but my understanding doesn't feel simple. Rather, it feels chaotic and confused. I can't begin to explain to you what it is that I don't understand so that you can help me understand it. You and I have a problem. If I can come to understand what you understand, and if you can come to understand what I don't understand, excuse the overuse of the word understand. <laughs> My head is spinning, but I want to know the title. 
Well, if anybody would like to follow up on this, it's on page 103 of my my book, Managing is Performing Art. But uh, I sense have renamed it Satchmo's Paradox. Uh, now I know I've heard that before. <laughs> because uh, Louis Armstrong really did say, somebody asked him, what is jazz? And he really did say, say if you don't understand what jazz is, you'll never understand. It, it's right there in Bartlett's quotations. And uh, yet, millions of people do learn to understand jazz. So the paradox or the mystery is how is it that we learn to understand things that we don't understand when the practitioner of the thing can't exactly explain it to us in straight ahead English. The practitioner is immersed in that problem all the time. And it certainly behooves a practitioner to try to learn to express or describe his or her practice and some of its key terms and so forth in as simple language as possible. But there's inevitably going to be there's inevitably going to be dimensions of the practice that uh, cannot be really explained in straight ahead English. They are too subtle and too too cryptic for a layman to just understand them if you just sit down and try to explain it. So Satchmo's paradox or the layman's lament, you take your take your pick. But notice that all of that has has little or nothing to do with the content of the practice, with the technical content of the practice. Uh, the what it has to do with is is understanding of communication problems communication mix-ups and and so forth. I, I, I want to emphasize that dimension of practice being interactive. It's interactive, but it's interactive in a, some very special ways. And one is its leadership dimension, and another is this phenomenon of, of uh, Satchmo's paradox, where the practitioner, the practitioner is having trouble explaining to uh, a layman, a layperson, just what it is that they're a practitioner of. I have often remember a, a comment that a, an engineering, a young engineer who was in practice made to me one time when he said, you know, everything, when you, when you were in school getting your degree, your, your master's or your doctoral degree in whatever the engineering specialty is, you're working at the absolute state of the art with with state of the art faculty members and students and state of the art problems but they never mention the fact that when you get out here on the job you're going to need to be able to explain what you're good at what your practice is about to the fellow across the table or the woman across the table in words of one syllable because they didn't major in what you majored in and I've always remembered that comment that the person across the table wants to know what you're contributing in words of one syllable so that they can so that they can dovetail with it and make and, and, and make use of it. I see a flip side of this, Peter. I'm thinking of Statchmo's paradox and the point that eventually you get to know jazz, you get to understand jazz. Well my, my point here is that the novice, the rookie has to be persistent, has to want to know, want to understand. If the yeah. ex expert is even looking down his or her nose, uh, don't run away. I, I think it, it, this gets back to that feeling of energy that one has about, I've got to know, help me understand, put it in simple terms and be persistent with that. And it becomes quite an interesting interaction, sometimes produces conflict. But if the person who needs to know has that strong feeling, they will learn it and, and they'll get better at asking experts how to get to the point and, and then share the degree of understanding they have. These would be vitally important conversations as we're constantly mixing uh, different practices these days. There's, there's a field of organizational uh, making things called agile, 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 and what they do is they put together scrum teams, sort of a, rug, a rugby analogy, 
uh, and uh, they come from uh, engineering, from production, from business, all the different elements that have to come together to make a, a product faster and test it faster yeah. with customers. So here's an example where you've got people with literally different technical languages in their practice minds, and they've got to come really fast to the understanding of what each other's talking about. So uh, that, that, this is a very helpful point uh, that we're making here to people more and more who will be in things like scrums or already are. And they're gonna say, oh yeah, now I get it. Uh, so thank you for that and <laughs> that insight. I just, uh, this morning, it literally, I sat down and made a sort of a free association list of um, other agencies, individuals and agencies that a practitioner might run into as he or she performs their practice. And it makes an interesting list. For instance, the first one I wrote down was a supplier of professional services. These are these are the varieties of roles that practitioners can be in. Practices, interactions can take many forms. For example, the supplier of professional services. Another one is a competitor in some sport or other activity where emphasis is, emphasis is on performing the practice. A third one is a learner in relation to one or more teachers and one or more other students. Another one is a buyer and a seller, as in various markets and exchanges. Another one is as a, a solitary practitioner, as with many hobbies, where the interactions are primarily in pre preparing the materials or displaying them in a finished form. And finally, a performer of the various forms of the arts. And that's only a beginning list of different kinds of agencies and in individuals a practitioner will have to uh, be able to interact with in a, in a um, productive way. It's a hell of a challenge. <laughs> and now we throw in the fact that in many instances, you have multiple languages involved. You, and when you have these virtual teams, you know, between China and France and US or between the North and the South in the United States, uh, it, it means that you're going to be making these exchanges, sometimes through translation, uh, sometimes trying to find a, a, a universal language like MAP. But the point is, you still want to move ahead. Each person wants to move ahead. So if the obstruction initially is language, then you work it out. If the obstruction is culture, then you have to learn more about that culture the other person is residing in so you're not forcing on them words or, or demands that are countercultural. So it's, a, <laughs> it's, it, it's like a bumblebee in a way, Peter, in my mind. You know, it's a, a bundle of bumblebee, it, it's impossible when you look at their shape and size and those tiny little wings. But uh, somehow or another, it works. And the same, I think, with keeping a practice in the air and moving ahead. Uh, it seems impossible sometimes, but it, you can make it work. You can keep yourself aloft. And uh, in particular, uh, I think of I think of the um, help that could be given in a given training environment or a classroom by the working adults who are in the room as students themselves, but are have already experienced all of these things. And the bells are ringing all all around their heads as they listen to a speaker talk about various characteristics of practice. It doesn't all have to come from one individual. But the the 22, 23, 24 year olds uh, fresh out of a master's program who are supposedly now competent to practice whatever they've got a master's degree in. They need this help. They need to have brought to their attention th these these issues, and in particular the idea that it's it's human behavior and organizations through and through. Amen through. to that. As we're moving towards the end of our time segment, Peter, I think you mentioned when we set this day up that you had 
at least one other thing that you wanted to read into the record. Uh, is this a good time to pause and have you choose that or? Well, no, that actually what I, what I was referring to was that list I just, I oh, just so made of that free association of um, forms of the forms or the settings of interaction that uh, the practitioners are going to encounter in their practice. That, that was what I had in mind. Okay. And, and, and that was fascinating because it's just to start on a list that anyone listening to this could put themselves on in terms of the, the way they've identified themselves in a practice. And then the point there is putting yourself on that list and then now you're in the midst of all different kinds of interactions that you're going to be uh, engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Uh, and then with technology and all, new, all kinds of new formats and with all kinds of unfamiliar uh, initially unfamiliar people. Well, just one more conjecture that uh, it kind of uh, grows out of some of the things we've said here. Okay. And that is, the way I put it to myself is that practice is directional. That uh, perhaps a more uh, ordinary way of saying it is that practitioners, practitioners have goals. They're trying to get somewhere. And uh, so there's a certain, there's a certain urgency to their interactions. If they're not just uh, whistling Dixie or passing the time of day. They're they're trying to get something done in 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 the interactions they're having with their practice. But the directionality of it, uh, the thrust of it, is what distinguishes, I think, distinguishes practice from applied science, which will be the subject of another one of our podcasts here down the, down the road. Uh, applied applied science is not as directional as practice needs to be, and uh, I can I can elaborate on that distinction at a later time. So yeah, that that that, that covers uh, most of the things I wanted to say under this heading of curiosities, kind of things you might not think of uh, as you reflected on practice, and things that are kind of interesting, particularly. The noun gerund one uh, always tickles me when I see run across an example of it. Yeah, I do, I do think that that last point on directionality takes us back to the uh, definition again, in that the key word is intended to to yeah. consistently produce intended result. Yeah. Now, sometimes the intention is shared. You have an organizational requirement or mandate, but that's never strong enough in my mind. You have to have your own intention to set direction. And in these days, again, you're set loose much faster than back in the day when people were basically in bureaucracies. So you better, you better recount on your personal sense of direction toward results that you want to achieve for an organization, in an organization, or on your own as an individual practitioner. Intention is such a powerful word. So. I think I put you to sleep. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do that. I mean, it's just, I keep talking. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm a perfect example <laughs> of a bottle of sleeping pill. But anyway, uh, no, this, is, this has been fun. And uh, as we're wrapping up, uh, final word uh, for the folks, and we'll uh, get ready for our next conversation. Well, in our next conversation, we're – we're moving into the myths and beliefs uh, uh, area, and uh, there are a number of things that I'd like to raise in that uh, in that under that category of myths and beliefs. And I hope we're stimulating our readers to think about some things about practice that maybe we haven't mentioned. Oh yes, yeah, definitely. Always going to be looking for feedback and fresh ideas. Uh, anything because we're we're. Uh, we have a, a bottomless appetite for insights into the, the subject that we put out here and we're talking about practice. So save some uh, of your uh, thoughts for the next time, Peter, and uh, thank you once again for another oh, thank fascinating you. conversation. Thank you so much, David. Thank you.